Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Neil Romanowski. I'm the Dean of University Libraries, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this fall semester's Authors at Alden event. Um, I've been informed actually that Authors at Alden is celebrating its 10th year this year. So very special thank you to the many authors and guests and staff who have made this series such a success over the years. And uh, of course, to our library's events coordinator, Jen Harvey, for um, organizing this evening's event. So uh, today we're hosting a conversation, um, really excited about this with poet Frank X and Lorraine Walkna, uh, who's a library subject librarian for film, theater, English, and African-American studies. Uh, together, they'll be discussing Professor X's most recent collection of poems, Masked Man, Black, Pandemic, and Protest Poems. So uh, Frank X is a professor of African-American and Africana Studies and English, as well as the director of the English MFA program at the University of Kentucky. Uh, to date, he has written 11 collections of poetry that have earned him multiple awards, such as the Lillian Smith Book Award in 2004, the Landon Literary Fellowship for Poetry in 2005, and NAACP Image Award in 2014, and the Judy Gaines Young Book Award in 2020, among others. He has served on the boards for the Kentucky Humanities Council, Apple Shop, and the Kentucky Writers Coalition, as well as serving as vice president of the Kentucky Center for the Arts and the executive director of Kentucky's Governor's School of the Arts. In 2013, Professor X was the first African-American writer to be named Kentucky's Poet Laureate, a native of Danville, Kentucky, he earned his Master of Fine Arts in Writing at Spalding University. And the University of Kentucky awarded Professor X an Honorary Doctorate of Humanities for his work with the community and his artistic achievements. And Transylvania University awarded him an Honorary Doctor of Letters. We're delighted to have you with us this evening, Professor X. And so please join me in welcoming Frank and Lorraine for a great conversation. Over to you both. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that generous introduction and I'm uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk about poetry anywhere, anytime. Uh, I think it's supposed to be easier because I'm, I'm technically at home uh, and doing this virtually, but I always miss being there in person. Uh, it's, I, I love the intimacy, uh, especially in a conversation. And I, and I really believe that what we're about to have today is it's more of a conversation than a than a kind of staid interview. Uh, so, Lorraine, I hope that's not asking too much of you. Um, and instead of doing anything else but poetry, I've, I'm just going to read to you uh, to get us started, to get you in the space to, uh, so you understand what's in the book. Uh, all I'll say about the book is that Masked Man, comma, Black, uh, pandemic and protest poems were started during the COVID pandemic um, as part of the uh, National Poetry Month prompt, you know, where I was committed to writing a new poem every day for the month of April. And for whatever reason, I usually don't, don't do this. I decided to make everything I was writing be connected to COVID uh, since it was such a brand new experience for me and there was so much that I did not understand or that was shocking uh, and for me poetry has always been a way to to ask the hard questions and to hopefully get answers and if nothing else to to process the anxiety uh, one might feel when they don't understand what's going on around them so that was my safe place and unfortunately, and fortunately, uh, at the end of April, I still did not feel safe. So I was still writing, I still wrote a poem every day until the middle of July. Uh, and so this collection I'm reading from came from that series of poems. Um, that's probably enough in the way of an introduction to a book. Um, I'm gonna try to read a variety of poems in less than 15 minutes that give you a, a full sense of what the book is trying to do uh, and how many different places. Um, when you first hear the word pandemic and COVID, I think the natural 
response is to go somewhere negative or to put yourself in a defensive posture, even philosophically. Uh, but I'm going to start in a different place because one of the beauties of one of the few beauties of COVID was being forced to stay at home, which is for me was a rare thing. I was always on the go, always traveling way too much. Uh, so I got a really generous opportunity to spend more time with my family uh, and rediscover that I loved them and, and missed them very much. Um, and when we decided to go outside, we had a chance to fall in love with our yard. Uh, it had just been a place to grow grass for several years and uh, we started gardening again. Um, and like most things, uh, my wife's approach to it and what she got out of it was very different than mine. So I'm gonna open up with a poem called Baptism by Dirt for Shauna. All believers know about the power of water, though not enough about the power of dirt. My mama used to walk barefooted in our vegetable garden, get down on her hands and knees and almost pray in the dirt. My wife and I and our three-year-old built and planted three raised bed gardens, watching her dip her fingers into the dirt to coddle what will feed us reminds me of mama and then what is it that women know about nurturing a seed into a piece of fruit, about believing in the power of dirt and suns and water? I return from our labor with sore knees and back, fingernails and hands caked with dirt. She floats back into the house cleaner, somehow less burdened, as if she spent the weekend burying all of her heavy things as if she whispered to something sacred and it whispered something back. Yeah, she's, uh, she's an avid gardener now, uh, like her mother. Uh, this next poem is a lot more political than that and it tries to take things that came right out of the news. I was really stunned of when a major food corporation finally admitted that the icons on their, uh, their breakfast products uh, were actually racist and, and came out of a racist tradition. Uh, so you hear references to, to a syrup and a, a rice and a pancake mix, uh, but you also will hear some other names and references to very contemporary issues that were happening during the protest part of uh, the multiple pandemics. This is called Mrs. Butterworth, Uncle Ben, and Aunt Jemima. Mrs. Butterworth, Uncle Ben, and Aunt Jemima walk into a bar in America. Butterworth says, I'm being repackaged. Ben says, I'm being rebranded. Jemima says, I remember when they branded my mama on her back. The bartender says, I could stand in the middle of Main Street and kill somebody, and I wouldn't lose any voters. Butterworth says, then I'll take eight bullets in my sleep. Ben says, choke me to death with your knee. Jemima says, lock me in a holding cell and say I decided to hang myself. The bartender poured the drinks, said he felt threatened and was simply standing his ground when he thought the thug was reaching for a gun. The headline said, well-loved American foods resisted arrest, failed to comply, and were delicious while black. Butterworth's daughter said, here's the, here's the progress. We might finally get an anti-lynching bill. Ben's son said, I'd rather they abolish qualified immunity. Jemima's kid said, you know, they abolished slavery once, then they hung my mama on that box. This next poem is a, an example of a persona poem. It's one of my favorite things to do, particularly when I'm talking about uh, historical events. And it's not quite history yet, though it is in the past, but I imagine that sometime in the future, 
my grandchildren will read about what has occurred in the last two years and think about it as ancient history. Uh, but this is this is about the George Floyd incident, uh, public lynching, and it tries to get some distance between the reader and the listener uh, by being in the voice of the knee, complicit and most. I am no more guilty than the officer's eyes choosing to look the other way. Technically, I was not even touching his neck. All I could feel was the hot cotton insides of Officer Chauvin's slacks against my skin. Almost nine minutes is a long time to kneel on the neck, especially if you are unaccustomed to praying or begging. But after pressing all of me down, he put this all on me as if he was planning to propose but got cold feet and was too embarrassed to get up and just walk away from this altercation, marrying us both to this moment till death do us part. And just a few more, and we'll get to the, the best part of the program, the questions. Um, DJ battle. One of the things that I missed the most about uh, the pandemic, it's, it's, you know, guys clamped down and shut down of activities was uh, going to a summer concert. And I really love outdoor old school summer concerts and what happens with DJs and um, all the things that are about the birth of, of rap music. So this is, this comes out of that era and has the epigraph that says, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Quote by President DJ Trump, DJ Battle. The oppressor's private property is always more important to the privileged. Their power is what police protect. Backed by a National Guard fronting the commander in cheat, known to incite and encourage violence against POC by the FOP and other good people versus thugs. If you don't understand this behavior or these people, you don't understand emotional or psychological trauma, you don't understand generational grief, and you really don't understand injustice or American history. No justice, no peace, no justice, no peace, no just ice raids, no guilty cops, just us dead, dying, and chalk marked over and over again like some whack DJ rewinding the bridge or dead refrain, scratching at our eyes with already viral, breathless, black body porn professionally made by the hands, feet, and now knees of thug police again. But instead of turning the tables, we drag out turntables and spin and spin and spin, searching old wax, seeking to sample something human, anything truly good to mix with this black in our lives until we matter. And I'll close with um, a poem that, uh, if I can find it. Yes, I'll close with this poem. Uh, because it asked a hard question, you know, is any of this laughable? Um, and I have this idea, this theory that, you know, you can test whether or not you've recovered from a traumatic event uh, by your capacity to, to hear a joke about it and then laugh. And we're not quite there yet, I don't think, but this is called Too Soon. So a smallpox blanket, a Tuskegee experiment, and a Republican governor all walk into a bar in Atlanta. It seems that everything, even the dark and the difficult, was funnier before COVID-19, if left to real comedians. Dave Chappelle's blind Black Klansman skit interrogated the complexities of race and the irrationality of American racism. Richard Pryor's personal struggle with addiction offered up humor born out of darkness and pain. 
They were rarely silly and goofy for saccharine's sake. Never mean-spirited, targeting someone less fortunate just for laughs. Making comedy self-deprecating without becoming minstrelsy is an art form, is a gift. We won't know if we can really survive the coronavirus until somebody makes a joke and it only hurts a little. So thank you. I think that's a fair introduction to what's inside these pages. And uh, Lorraine, let's jump into this dialogue. All right. OK. Um, I'm going to start a little bit of history, just a tiny bit. And if you could talk a little bit about you are an Afrolatian poet. And I want to make sure our audience understands Afrolatian and what that means and why you thought it, it was necessary. Um, it's a fascinating story. If you could just, does that give you enough of a question? It does. I'll, okay. try, I'll try to tell the short version. Uh, the Afrolatian poets are a um, ethnic collection of, of writers um, which began in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, officially 30 years ago, uh, 1991. Wow. Mm. Um, and most of us are still not just practicing writers, but most of us are in the academy in some capacity as administrators or, or teaching full time. Um, all of us have, you know, we figured out very early that if you're going to commit to poetry, uh, you probably need another job as well. <laughs> <laughs> and teaching turned out to be the best complement to, to a life as, as a writer. We all have determined very early, you know, because of summers off and winter breaks and spring breaks on some campuses. Um, because we all wanted to write, we had our own personal stories to tell. And, you know, became a, that word is born out of going through a reading that had been uh, renamed when they added an African-American writer to the collection. Uh, the first lineup featured the most outstanding writers from Appalachia, and the title reflected that. Um, when they added Nikki Finney, who at the time lives in California, they scratched that title and called it something else. Um, and I left that amazing reading and, and made it all the way home, still wondering about why they changed the title. I uh, took the time to look up the definition of Appalachia in my dictionary from that era. And it said the white residents of the mountainous regions of Appalachia. And I was stunned by that because it automatically erased a whole group, whole groups of people of color who lived in the same space. Um, and I didn't understand how something as, as official as a dictionary uh, can make a choice like this mm -hmm. when clearly uh, most people knew that it wasn't a 100% but it also fed into how powerful the stereotype of the region uh, and even worse all the negative characters how powerful they were that people still believed them uh, so i wrote a poem trying to interrogate that idea and at the end of the poem i used for the first time the word appalachian um, and i took it back to my writing group as we met every monday night for two hours uh, and the, my fellow writers you know, we had been meeting together for about a year, but uh, there was something about the word to them that got them excited. And that very night, we named ourselves the Afrolatian Poets because we felt like that, you know, what that word did was uh, create community uh, to do the exact opposite of a word that left people out. And you know, we wanted a word that included as many people as possible. And uh, so we decided to, you know, be the voice of the uh, silent and muted uh, and to help people find a voice and to, to be heard. Um, I think we're all, you know, young activists in training. And so the social activism that probably connected all of our work uh, continues to this day. And um, if we all write about anything that's in common, it has to do with family and identity and place, social justice. And in my case, History is a big theme of mine. So that's the short version of that story. OK, because it was interesting when I, I was listening to some reading and listening to other things of yours. And you were also, I mean, this whole, a lot of your work, you, you want to uncover the people that 
that haven't been heard, right? But you also made this really interesting, like nobody says, let me see if I get the names right. No one goes, oh, George Clinton and Appalachia, Carter Woodhouse and Appalachia. And I think it's fascinating that you're connecting uh, the two like that. And you also bring even more rich heritage to Appalachia by doing that. Like, I don't really know if I have a question in there, but I, I found that just very fascinating. Well, I think I hear you. And, and to me, I've, you know, two things were happening for me mentally. I was trying to understand how a space, a physical space with so much, not just so much authentic African-American history, uh, but we're talking about African-American historical figures who, who set the pace in their art forms. Mm -hmm. you know, August Wilson, uh, who, I mean, is one of the greatest American playwrights, you know, uh, who wrote 10 plays that as recent as three years ago won um, several Oscars, uh, you know, for Fences, you know, so these, you know, and that comes out of the, the Pittsburgh African American community, uh, you know, that people somehow it, try to render invisible. If you go the other direction and go down to Birmingham, Alabama, which a lot of people don't consider Appalachia, but even the ARC has designated it as an official space in Appalachia. Of, you know, you have activists, you have amazing poets, you know, like Sonia Sanchez comes out of that space. Um, you know, if you think about history and civil rights, uh, the bombing ham nickname came out of Birmingham. And, you know, most of the visual images you see when you look at civil rights video from the era, young people being water holes down the street and having dogs sicked on them. A lot of that comes, you know, out of that same space. Um, but there was something about, you know, that space uh, in between, Jesse Owens, who we all have heard about forever, but have never heard the word Jesse Owens, the name Jesse Owens and the word Appalachia mentioned in the same space. You know, musicians, uh, you know, Nina Simone, Roberta Flack, uh, Bill Withers, uh, athletes, movie stars, the Black Panther, uh, Chadwick Boseman, all from Appalachia. And I could go on and on and this litany of, of names is so long, you wonder how a little Abner and the Beverly Hillbillies can outshine and silence and render invisible all those individuals when it comes to thinking about who's in that region. And so how a definition as late in the world as 1991 that suggests it was an all white space could survive is it, just ridiculous to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of my work is, is involved in challenging that notion and, and, and hoping people will question their own definition of the region. Um, you know, sometimes it's a very you know, clinical, scholarly look at the same region that just goes through and lists uh, numbers of people who live there. You know, people who live in what I consider the, the outside cities, outside of the traditional space that is Appalachia, but they're from Appalachia, but they've moved to other cities to find jobs and to work, but they still consider Appalachia home because their grandmothers or grandparents, or they hope to be buried back there, and, or they go back every Sunday to eat, uh, to visit, to family reunion, uh, to all kinds of events that, that never separate them from the space. So to me, I'm, I've never limited, uh, or created geographical limits for what we consider Afrolatcha. You know, it's more of an idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more of a claiming space and and, and making sure other people uh, are challenged to see it differently. And you know, one of the biggest compliments has been seeing is seeing other groups uh, name themselves. You know, I, I know at least one Cuba Latin and uh, Asian Latins and uh, Arab Latins, who all 
inhabit or born in the space, who claimed the space, and who felt like that, you know, they were closer to Afro-Latcha than Appalachia, uh, especially if that definition didn't include them. And if you look at all the mass media, even of Kentucky by itself, you know, you think about the power of the Kentucky Fried Chicken and Beverly Hillbillies mm -hmm. and uh, the Dukes of Hazard, uh, Justified, at least the first season, those films and, and, and media products still perpetuated the stereotype and the caricature of, the, of all white space. And once they sold that, they could sell the other things that deal with culture and literacy and ignorance uh, and the value system that of, is insulting on, on almost every level. Um, so it, it's, it's, you know, it's mission work. Uh, just uh -huh. telling a story, but part of, of my mission is to say it as loudly as possible and as often as possible and, and, and do it with poetry. Uh, that way, it usually doesn't hurt as much when people are challenged uh, to rethink something they thought they knew. Right. Can you say again what your mission was? I'm, I got, uh, you got like. I'm sorry, that, that our mission was to say it as loudly uh, and as often as possible uh, whenever we got the chance. Oh, OK. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, and I'm just I don't want to get I want to get to your poems, but I just have one other little question, which is um, you were a fiction writer by tra by education, but you decided to move towards poetry. And I'm curious why you did that. And. I mean. Um, and po and poetry as a way for you to also. Uh, Speak about history. You know, I'll do the first part of that first. Uh, I'm often asked that question, but I don't feel like I chose poetry. It shows you. I, not only did it choose me, I think my lifestyle only allowed for poetry to, to become my primary voice. Um, I'm, I might be the busiest person I know, um, and but I'm comfortable with that. I like that speed. I like uh, I'm not comfortable being of uh, you know of uh, my mother would say lazy, you know, the she really believed, you know, uh, the idle hands are a devil's workshop. You know, she was a Pentecostal minister for 22 years and she raised seven of us in her house. And I'm one of eleven in total. Uh, even in high school, you know, I played all the major sports. I, um, I worked at the school. I was a student. I was in five different organizations. Um, and that became a pace for me that I still try to maintain. Um, it was out of comfort. And I think because of that, when I started looking for ways to express myself through literature, um, I had enough time to, to write poetry and to collect it, to gather it, but it took more time than I had to, to write fiction. For me, I need large chunks of time to, to really create good, solid fiction. Um, if I can write a poem in the airport or on a bus ride or driving from one city to the next, and I can hold it in my head until I get home, until I get to a place where I can write it down. Fiction for me requires much more support than that. So as a consequence, I've written a whole lot of poems and my fiction has, has happened, but it's just really, really slow. Currently, I kind of just began another rewrite of a, of a novel that I started 10 years ago. And in those 10 years, I think I've probably written seven books and poetry. So you know, it's like in basketball, they say, you know, take what the defense gives you. <laughs> That's my approach to being productive as a literary person. It's just, you know, what, how much time do I have? What, 30 minutes? Okay, uh, I'll read something. You know, yeah. I'll edit a poem, you know. What, I've got all night, all weekend? I'll drag out my novel and work on that. I've got the whole weekend. But as a, I became a, a young parent, uh, committed parent, full-time parent, and it really helped 
uh, prioritize, you know, my time and there's no such thing as extra time. Uh, and I'm also a playwright and a visual artist, you know, so it, it's always been a big challenge, you know, getting a, what I thought was a great idea and trying to figure out what is it supposed to be? Uh, and I'm done with this thing. Sometimes a theme might be echoed, you know, in multiple spaces because it's, I just can't let it go. You know, one of my personal obsessions is, is the middle passage, you know, considering the trafficking of African peoples into the new world. Um, in North and, and South America, um, in the Caribbean. And so if you look through my visual art, you can probably find 10 different examples over the last five years where that theme has come up. If you look at my written work, you could probably find 10 different examples. That's where it come up. Uh, if you read my fiction, you find at least two references to the same thing. And I think that as writers, I think that's how we do battle uh, with our creative is, is to kind of unearth the things we are obsessed about. Um, if you read my work closely, you can not only find out my political leanings, but you can find out what I'm obsessed about and who I'm obsessed about. Right, right. Um, thank you. Um, I'm just doing a quick check in. I am every once in a while losing you, not losing you, but you're freezing, but it could be me. So well, I'm just I, I hear a, I hear a buzz. Not yeah, I did. Um, OK. Yeah, but you, I, you're not freezing. I think we're just fighting a little bit of a bad connection and we're just going to have to go through it because I don't okay. think that there's much we can do about it, unfortunately. OK. okay. So I want to, now let's get to this book. And I have, wow, well, I have so many questions for you about this book. So you started writing it for Poetry Month. And would you have written for Poetry Month anyway? But it seemed especially important to do this now. And when you write for Poetry Month, do you have any kind of rules you give yourself or how you approach a poem a day? Well, you did say COVID focused. COVID pandemic, Black Lives Matter, what was going on? Did you have any other rules you give yourself for a poem a day? Yeah, well, for, for that particular series of poems, uh, it was even broader than that. You know, I was just saying, uh, write about the thing that you can't let go of when you lay down to sleep at night. Ah. And so, I would say the poetic process for those poems began while I was sleeping because sometimes okay. I think about those those things and wake up with these ideas that my subconscious had worked out. Um, so they gift me with these early lines just to get me started. But I've been working on them for six hours, um, and now mm -hmm. I was up and put them on on paper. Um, but yeah, you know, I tried I tried not to limit myself too much, you know. Uh, as far as where the poems, you know, I want to give them a chance to speak. Uh, you know, I trust them to tell their own truth. And, you know, the editing process will, will catch them when they're wrong. You know, mm -hmm. that's the power of the craft, for me at least. And now when it switched from the pandemic to protest, it had as much to do with the fact that that's what was happening on the news, you know. Mm -hmm. We were already in a very low place with the pandemic and thinking, you know, being afraid of how long this was going to last and the impact on our, our lives. And thinking just when we thought it couldn't get any worse, then boom, uh, COVID was no longer in the news, but it had, had not gone away. There was other thing that was even more horrendous than that. And then that turned into you know, from George Floyd, um, you know, there were so many other individuals, you know, yeah. consider that some of those are just being tried today and this this past week, uh, that it seemed like this litany of names and events and occurrences were just happening over and over and over like it was on a spin cycle. Yeah. So it was another kind of, you know, I thought about these multiple pandemics on multiple fronts. Um, and the emotional toll on individuals, you know, caught in the middle. Uh, I, I lost 
a lot of loved ones in the last two years, a lot of good friends, a lot of relatives. Um, they announced yesterday on the news that 10,000 people have officially died from COVID in Kentucky. And I thought that's, you know, that's a lot of bodies. That's the same number of African-Americans who fought uh, for the Union in the Civil War uh, from Kentucky, you know, so that, I mean, that number, when I try to visualize those numbers, it's just, it's, it's surreal. So, and because of that, and there was nobody in my house, you know, holding my hand and saying, you know, I'm your therapist and just talk about it. Uh, my wife and I, and you know, we have teenage 16 year olds uh, and a three year old at home. And, you know, we would just watch the news and go silent. Uh, and not be sure what we should be talking about, uh, but all sharing that thing that you get as if you're, you're at a funeral. And yeah. so, the, you know, this parade of death happened for so long. Um, you know, the, the book struggles to find something that deals with humor, it struggles to find something that deals with a kind of pure love that pulls out of that negative space. I was, and I was trying to do that because I was trying to explain, you know, how we survived that first year, you know, what we did, what we had, um, and there are poems about me feeding birds and watching birds, and I hadn't been committed to anything, you know, that important to nature in over 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly, you know, there was something about the process that made me feel more whole and provided a level of healing. Okay. Um, and made the world make more sense. Uh, so it's, you know, so I think we were unconsciously trying to create our own medicines uh, sure. and make sure that when this is all done, that we were still here. It's best, you know, at least take responsibility for making sure we're here in case COVID has a better idea or a different idea. But <laughs> we weren't going to help. Uh, right. Well, you sort of like went into my next question in a way because. I was thinking like it must have been very difficult balancing positive and negative thoughts. And I mean, every day you could probably write something that was negative or disturbing or violent or destructive. And so finding the positive, but also putting, you put, how many poems are in here? 80, about 80. So when you put them all together, what is that? Was it hard to make that picture? Was it hard to put them together and balance the positive and the negative? And 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 I'm curious what you, what you wanted to give us when you were done with that. Well, the one thing that I, the editor and I agree on, was we didn't want to separate the pandemic from the protest mm -hmm. uh, because they overlapped and they fed each other. And we didn't. We also didn't want them to be chronological. Uh, we really wanted to to have poems that that played off each other. Uh, you know, I, I learned writing a book about Megar Evers and his assassination that if you put too many negative poems together, that people can only take so much. <laughs> yeah. And there comes a point where they won't turn another page. They just decide to bow out because it's just too dark. You know, so I, I didn't want it to be so heavy that people wouldn't get all the way through it. So, um, you know, a lot of the poems that are lighter are placed where they're placed because you know, this is this is where you get a chance to breathe. Uh, but these are serious subjects, so you know we can't take it for granted. We can't treat it lightly. We have to deal with it in as honest a way as possible. But at the same time, we have to protect ourselves and give ourselves a chance to breathe. Right. So we can go on. And that was that was the only logic to the to the order. Um, the only thing we struggled with was, you know, what the last poem should be. You know, what we what do we want to leave people with? Um, and you know, we flipped through several times trying to find the happiest poem <laughs> <laughs> and decided that, you know, that was uh, that was an unfair task. Uh, I mean, you don't have happy and COVID in the same sense. <laughs> it, 
it's not real COVID if everything is happy and hunky dory. But um, you know, we decided to just think, you know, what just think about breathing, you know. You know, what do you where do you want to leave people at in the the breath pattern? Mm -hmm. You know, you could leave them at some place that takes their breath away, or you can leave them in a place where they find themselves uh, almost meditative because they They've slowed down enough to to see people and things close up and in a real way. You know, I think there's a poem I have that's dedicated to um, people who worked in factories for poultry processing, because uh, there was this idea at some point that the economy was more important in people's lives, and there were all these companies around the country that had these extremely high rates of COVID deaths. And they weren't protecting their employees. Uh, you know, there was no PPE yet. They hadn't been figured out. They hadn't, they hadn't figured out what they needed. And eventually they were able to get everybody gloves and put up at least plexiglass device between workers. Uh, and then the mass came and, and those deaths, uh, you know, plateaued. Um, but before that, it was happening and it never made the news in the same way that you know, I have a personal relationship with Native America and, and several reservations. And even today, most people have no idea uh, that in the United States, the, the worst cases, uh, the most situations that look like it's, it's more, more than a pandemic, that it looks like genocide, mm -hmm. is if you visit Native American reservations and see how many peoples were were devastated and just wiped out. I mean, the numbers are horrific. Um, but not unlike the prison system, things that happen in, in those spaces are outside of the regular news cycle. And so if you don't read about it, it's like it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I wanted to make sure that, you know, I had a chance to to hold hands with the, those spaces as well as, as, as my own spaces and communities, especially when we found out that you know, people of color uh, were dying at a higher rate uh, than anybody else, period. And, and then my own personal losses were, were happening. So, you know, it's, there was no easy direction for anybody. You know, there, there are no winners in this thing, uh, except maybe the people who get the money from the COVID tests. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they call, you know, somebody's paying for those and um, somebody's getting paid. But so okay, I have a question for you. I'm gonna. I'm since we're getting it's getting heavy and negative. We gotta do that thing, like you said. I'm gonna go a little bit more positive, right? But I'm curious about how you lay the poems out. And I never know with poets if this matters. But like sometimes, like I don't know if people can see this, but it's got a shape to it. And um, I was curious about the shape. And you also have a couple poems, I believe, Ode to Meat Packers. You read the poem and you have to turn the page to get to the next three lines. So like within me, I had to pause, turn, read. And I'm curious about that kind of structure and uh, like, is it intentional and that kind of thing? Well, my easy answer is I think of punctuation uh, well, first, I think of white space even as part of punctuation. And I think of punctuation uh, of, as stage direct directions in the theatrical piece. Oh, sure. Uh, and I, I want my poems to move. I want them to, when they stop, you know, I want it clear to, to clearly understood how many beats that is, uh, you know, how much breath you have before you go to the next thing. I'm really conscious of those kinds of choices in the crafting process. Mm -hmm. um, the first poem you mentioned uh, is about weather. Uh, on, and one way of reading it is, is just about weather, but we know it's not just about weather. Mm. So I wanted it to be shaped like a funnel cloud. Okay. Um, and so oh. you get this tornado yeah. effect of yeah. when you look at it initially, and then when you read about it, you know, you, it's... <laughs> Not just weather, it's dangerous weather. Uh, and so I'm always looking for multiple layers of, of meaning. Uh, sure. you know, 
I'm really committed to as many people reading my work and appreciating it, no matter what level of education they have. Um, I mean, the biggest compliment I've ever gotten was regarding its accessibility. Um, and, you know, I, I've even had, had a man come up to me at a book fair and, and say to me that I, I don't write, I don't, I don't read poetry. I don't even write <laughs> poetry, but I keep buying this damn book and giving them away. <laughs> and I, and then he bought three more books. And, and, I was <laughs> and I'm thinking, you got to be reading some of this if, if you think it's still worth giving away. Um, but, you know, he was, but I think he came, you know, he was older than, than me. So I think he came out of that, that space in the world where, um, you know, being a poet or, or reading and enjoying poetry uh, somehow meant something weak about you if you were a man. Mm -hmm. And so I remember when I first started writing as a college student, uh, writing in that space, uh, how private I was about what I did. You know, I was very public as a playwright and a visual artist, but uh, the poetry I kept close to my chest. And, and I carried a, uh, a journal, but it didn't look like a journal. It looked like a, a sketchbook uh, because people knew I was a visual artist. Nobody ever accused me of being a poet. Uh, and eventually I grew out of that, but, but I inherited that idea of what poets were and what poetry did and who it was for. Uh, and I've been trying to do battle against that, you know, ever since then, uh, because I think everybody deserves poetry in their life. I think that you know, there's no, I mean, your quality of life is severely impacted by how much art is in it. And I think mm -hmm. writing and creative work as art. It's not just for the people of course. at the university level. It's not just for, for rich people. Um, and so my subject uh, and my subject matter often, you know, try to go every possible direction so that at some point, if you finish the whole book, if you didn't find yourself in there somewhere uh, on a page, and I failed, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about you. Even if it's a collection of persona poems about another historical figure, you should still be able to find yourself as the poem is also, it's about Megha Evers' wife, you know, lamenting the loss of, of their privacy. Um, and, and look at that metaphorically and realizing that the poem is also about uh, a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. uh, and that opens up a window for other people who've experienced that kind of pain to step into that poem and not even know who Mega Evers or Merle Evers. Right. Anything about them, but be able to identify with that pain in that moment. And then they're there, you know, it's, it's their poem, it's their book, it's their collection. It's about them and it's for them. And I always want that. And I don't ever want to be that poet just writing for other poets or just writing for the Academy or, uh, I mean, there's, there's poetry that I've read and that I just don't like. I mean, but I know it still sells and people love it. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder, you know, how conscious is the decision uh, to write in that way and, and, and who you're writing for? And I think for me, it's very important to me that people that I grew up with uh, participate in my art mm -hmm. uh, and can find themselves in it. I would say, if you don't find yourself in this book of poems, then you can't possibly be breathing because <laughs> it's very, there's something, I mean, whoa. Um, Jennifer, Jen says I have to um, open for questions, but I just wanted to ask you one thing about the title of the book because I do have to uh, give a nod to Paul Dunbar, who is an Ohio poet, Hi. writer. And um, I don't know if when you were writing this, you kind of went, oh, Dunbar's poem. Or did you say in the beginning, oh, Dunbar's poem? And I just wanted that connection, not, you know, just to hear, just just curious if what kind of connection you had between Dunbar's poem and yours. Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with the poem. It used to be a poem that I had memorized and would recite uh, in, in academic spaces. Uh, but it's always been a powerful poem to me. and. 
for me, it's also one way to acknowledge, um, you know, where I came from and, and who, uh, you know, who came before me uh, and whose work um, I'm in the tradition of. You know, I don't, I don't, never pretended to, to have invented an art form or, or, or anything. Uh, but I know that Langston Hughes and Paul Lawrence Dunbar are much better poets than I will ever be. <laughs> uh, and so it was, it's, a nod, it's a nod to them, it's a nod to that era, that, to that great work. Of, and it also acknowledges that, you know, you're gonna see the same poems over and over again throughout history. Of, and it opens up this window to talk about it and compare, you know, two, two spaces in history, you know, mm -hmm. now and then. Um, and it's, it's, you know, is it, there's a whole lesson plan on that one page. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> that, you know, forces the unknowing to do some research, to look up his work and either come across the dialect poems or the his sonnets. Um, you know, decide how political he was trying to be or, or, and accept the fact that none of that was accidental, that he knew exactly what he was doing. And, right. Uh, and see, you know, see how the poems can still live today. You know, that's, to me, you know, that's the biggest barometer. You know, it's how long will this work, you know, be valid? You know, how long will it speak to people? Um, you know, think about how much I love music and how my teenagers have always been frustrated when they think they have a new song. <laughs> uh, they don't know. It's just a, re, a reboot, you know, has been remade and, and they catch us singing it too. And it, they're, they're so, they're so yeah. disappointed that it's not brand new. Um, and people say Shakespeare has that quality because his work is kind of eternal. Uh, I think the same thing about Stevie Wonder and mm -hmm. his lyrics and Marvin Gaye and his lyrics and the activism uh, and the beauty and the art they created, you know, they didn't compete with each other. They inhabit the same space. And that's all I'm trying to do uh, yeah. is respect that and those examples and to, you know, cover up my own space there as well. Right, right. Yeah, I, um, where was I going with this? Hmm. Anyway, um, I think we should open up for questions, even though I want to ask you 20,000 other things. But, um, oh, I just, regarding the Paul Dunbar, I will say that there were, I, I went again and looked and I read the poem again, which is, is it also called Masked Man Black? Dunbar's no, poem? it's called We Wear the Mask. We Wear the Mask, that's right, We Wear the Mask. And then I started reading again and like that he was a pro, he was an activist and he was and it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So your way of writing, you're also teaching me history, you're also your 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 work is thought provoking. So I'm gonna go on and compliment you to the end of time, but I'm gonna let some people ask you some questions here. Do you, you ready for that? Well, it depends what they ask, but <laughs> let's see, let's see. All right, so I'm going to moderate the, the chat for you, Frank X, um, and we actually already have a couple questions in chat. Um, for those of you listening, if you'd like to raise your hand and unmute yourself to ask a question, that's fine, or if you'd rather type it into the chat, however works best for you. So while you're thinking about that, I'm going to read um, our first question, which was early on, um, and I believe this is in reference to the definition of the Appalachian people as being only white. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, Judy, on this, uh, but Judy Carey Nevin says, uh, we had a book discussion earlier today on Jacqueline Woodson's Brown Girl Dreaming uh, and talked about what gets left out of telling family history and how that affects a person's identity. Judy would like to know, how did discovering that you had been left out of that dictionary definition affect your picture of your identity? Uh, I think it, it made it more visible to me. You know, I think that uh, I didn't know there was such structure, such um, institutional uh, led efforts to, to erase me. Uh, and I took it personal. Uh, and it was easy to commit to actors and artists to, to try to do battle against that, you know. Uh, and then be a champion of, of the same people who were 
were victimized in the same way. You know, I think that I, I was in upstate um, Washington, the state of Washington, a university campus, and I just finished the reading and the Q and A started, and the young man sort of asked and asked me if there were other black people in Kentucky. And I was stunned at first, like, you know, do I look like a test tube baby? What are you saying? Um, and I and I quickly understood that he had never been to Kentucky uh, and everything he knew or believed about Kentucky came to him via the lens of the television and mass media, you know, and thanks to the power of Andy Griffith and Beverly Hillbillies and you know, and in this in that era, you know, there were people who still had seen deliverance and, and were moved by it. Uh, and but also accepted the the caricatures that that movie advanced. Uh, but all those those media images, you know, pushed for this idea of an all white space. Um, you know, so I remember pretending to count all the black people in Kentucky for the, <laughs> the young, young man who asked the question. I think about my siblings and then my mom and dad and my grandparents. And, and I think he was really waiting for me to total the final number. Um, but then I, you know, I moved away from that and just start talking about the power of, of doing your own personal research, you know, of going to find out for yourself. Um, and then research became this, this powerful new weapon for me, you know. I, I could never run out of things to write about because I love the research process, you know. I've taught whole classes, whole craft classes uh, based on taking my students to the archives and and giving them a, a set of, uh, of questions that force them to create brand new uh, creative work based on something they find that not only is interesting but connects with them out of that space that they never even knew about before that that discovery process becomes you know part of the birth of this new gem of an idea uh, and it, I've never been um, disappointed at the quality of the work that comes out. And I'm, I'm never surprised at how stunned the students are that they can actually create good work that they're proud of from that process. And of course, the people in the archives love the class. And we always close the semester with a, a major reading of, of the work they've created because they all finish with a chat book, thematically chat book from whatever they researched. Uh, and we read it in that space. And it really is gotten my students closer to recognizing how important research is. Uh, without it, you know, you're stuck writing about yourself and telling your own story. And, and I said earlier, you know, I, was, I was pretty quickly bored with me and my story. Um, but I love history so much. There are so many stories that haven't been told. Um, and often I say that, you know, I write them as poems because I can't afford to make the movies. Um, and, you know, thanks to to smartphones, that no longer is true. You know, you can make a, a movie uh, for free uh, just by downloading the free software and knowing how to, to manipulate uh, the device um, and understand how movies work. So, you know, there's a... So, so should we be looking for a movie coming from you soon? Actually, uh, I, I've coped with several, but... Uh, the last book of poems connected to Lewis and Clark uh, in this York trilogy that I've written uh, was purchased by a film company in California, and they are already in pre-production uh, to make a feature film about York. Excellent. Uh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, it's been a strange process because I don't know anything about Hollywood, uh, <laughs> but I, I've had an opportunity to spend time in spaces with the filmmakers and, and members of the company. I, I went out to the Nez Perce um, reservation with them for almost a month over the summer, three summers ago, uh, when the pre-production began. And it was just amazing to watch how they work. And, and you know, they work at such a different scale, you know. Uh, they financed the movie in advance, you know. I don't know that I would ever have to go get $30 million to finish a book of poems, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but to be able to do that is, is just amazing. Uh, I'm humbled 
to just to, to be as far away as I feel, but as close as it seems. Um, I mean, it's not a life I would trade trade for, uh, but I've loved the, the kind of built-in excitement that just comes with that relationship. Um, I think I look forward to seeing what that artist does with my material. You know, that's the one thing I had to learn um, that once the artist, which is the director and the editors, you know, whoever's creating the, the vision of, for the film, that is their, is their piece of art. Uh, and that they're not necessarily trying to tell the story that I was trying to tell. Uh, they're trying to find a piece that speaks to them. And I just hope it's not so far away from my story that I don't recognize it. Um, but they already paid me, so it, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm glad, by the way, they're doing this. I, of all the things I read, I'm like, they, that York, yeah. he's got to be a movie. So congrats on that. Thank you. We do have another question in the chat, and Judy would like to know what's going to happen to the poems you didn't include in this book. You know, uh, good question. I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, yeah, I guess it depends on what COVID does. Because I, I thought several times that uh, I stopped writing when I did so I could pull together the book. But the same kind of stuff is still happening in the news. Was it worth starting up again uh, and trying to do it a second time? Then I thought, you know, I'm not sure I could carry that much pain again. It was not an easy process. Uh, you know, swimming in that kind of darkness uh, for, you know, a month at a time, it seemed. Um, so, you know, I think that maybe they'll end up in kind of an unpublished collection or best of, of I mean, not, you know, I like to, you know, on my best days, I would think it's, you know, the same thing that Prince did, just put it all in the vault. And they, they'll pull out all these unpublished books, you know, when I'm gone. Um, but I hadn't thought about it. I mean, that, that's, that's a fair question. Um, but I like to think that the ones that are in the book uh, are not just the best ones, but um, they're the ones that told the story of the period the best. Because uh, I, I want people to be able to pick up this book years after COVID and want to understand what COVID was like at that time in America was like, uh, and read the book and go, oh, I get it. Um, I hope it works like that. I hope it lasts that long. All right, we had a few more questions come into chat and bear with me while I, I catch up with all you fast typers. Um, Steph Kendrick is asking, um, well, states, I imagine taking on this project was mentally and emotionally difficult. Uh, how did you separate yourself from the work when you needed to and, and how do you like to wind down? Well, my process does allow that to be easier for me. Uh, I'm most creative in the morning. Uh, ever since I was in high school, I've been able to wake up at 4.30 every morning, no matter what time I go to sleep, without an alarm clock. Um, and I wake up ready to write. You know, I, I start, the process for me has already begun before I open my eyes. Uh, because I, when I'm trying to, when I'm really in a creative space, uh, I learned a special process that I don't mind sharing uh, that exploits how our subconscious works. Uh, you know, if you, if you give yourself a question um, and you can't answer it immediately, but then you go to sleep, your subconscious doesn't sleep. So your subconscious will work on your question while you are asleep. Um, and may even solve it or find the answer for you and then sit there and wait for you to wake up. So sometimes when you wake up in the morning and something pops in your head immediately, that's just your subconscious. And the answer has been there for hours, but it's been waiting for you to be conscious enough to receive it. Um, I learned to do that when I first started writing the York, uh, York books and the York poems because, you know, not only would I be devouring whole books at a time uh, to try to learn as much about 1803 and the expedition as I could. Uh, I had a 
IMAX video uh, that I would watch that, re that recreated the, the journey to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and I would watch that as I was falling asleep. Uh, so I would ultimately dream about being on the expedition. Uh, and part of that also be accompanied by a question that I may not have known the answer to. For, for example, um, like most enslaved individuals, York didn't know when his birthday was. He, he couldn't have known because it was so unimportant uh, to his owners that uh, they might just record the year uh, and not the actual day. Uh, and because he was treated as, as, as chattel, uh, there were no birthdays and, and those kind of celebrations in, in, most, in most cases. I'm, I'm sure there's some examples where that is not actually the truth. Um, so I remember watching the videos uh, and then asking myself, when was York's birthday or when would it have been? Uh, and then just, you know, having the most beautiful and powerful dreams and, um, and waking up the next morning and, and writing out this poem um, that was had an additional trigger uh, in the crafting process because I was also using the actual Lewis and Clark journals uh, as, as seeds for new poems. And my birthday is June the 11th. Uh, and I found a passage about York in the journals on June the 11th. Uh, and I used part of that for the epigraph of the poem about his own birthday. Um, you know, so that's most people will read that poem and not think anything about it and whatever they thought about it, they wouldn't think there was a personal connection to me, but um, in the same way that I always try to sneak in my mother's name, her name is Faith, but in the appears in books, I put it, I capitalize it so it looks like a name. Uh, in every book I've written, you know, there's Faith is in there. Uh, that's for my mom. And in this particular case, you know, this is one of the things I did. Uh, I just hid just for me, uh, my own birthday. Um, inside of an actual entry from the actual journals uh, that happened to advance the story in, in the way that it needed to do and do this additional thing at the same time. And I always love it when that happens, but get a poem doing extra work or double duty or triple duty, mm -hmm. uh, creates a kind of density that makes it more accessible to more people. Great. Um... Kelly Broughton would like to know, um, how long have you been taking your students to the archives and have you noticed any changes in the way they, the ways they interact with those collections over that time? Of, you know, the only change is that in the beginning, it, it was such a foreign idea to, to my grad students that uh, they were a little apprehensive about it. Uh, but then it got to the point where some students were choosing to come to the program because they heard about how the archive is used uh, and they were his history buffs or, or potential archivists uh, or they had read some of the material produced. And it's a really broad, you know, sense of, okay, it's more about how to use the material, you know, how to harvest it and process it for new work. Of, and it, it's never too far away from where you are as, as a writer. For instance, uh, what I do is at the very first week of school, when I teach the archive class, I ask my students to give me three or four topic areas that they're very interested in. You know, let's say pioneer medicine or, um, you know, miscarriages uh, in the 18th century, um, you know, uh, divorce, uh, or you know any anything whatever you, but it has to be something that you personally are interested in. Uh, so I send all those topics for each student to archives, and we have such a good relationship. What they do is they know that uh, two weeks from that date when they receive it, that my students going to show up. Uh, and what they do for those two weeks is they start coming through archives and pulling everything they can that touches those topics. So when my students come in. They have a whole bookshelf of material that includes photographs, uh, films, books, letters, documents, uh, posters, uh, anything you can imagine 
uh, that might spark a poem or a new idea. And so when they come in, you know, they, they learn how to use the archives and they find out the regular hours of, and I turn them loose, you know, we, we, you know, they use, they have to come there and they can't check out the archive stuff because it's in archives, but, you know, they give us a whole classroom space in archives in the old library. Uh, and that's where we have class for almost a month. Uh, and then once they get the seeds, then the crafting process starts and we finish out the semester crafting those poems born out of the archives into a collection that is thematically linked. Um, for me, the most successful uh, set of poems came from a young woman who was, uh, who was interested in dementia because both her grandparents were experiencing dementia. And in her, in her archives, she came across a set of photographs that were slices of brains of people in, in different levels of dementia. And for her, they were like the Rorschach test. Uh, they look like certain kinds of things. Um, and so that's where she began. And the poems that came out of that process uh, were made richer because she also had her own grandparents' uh, love letters to each other from World War II. Uh, and they, you know, they were, you know, what they were saying to each other then, and, 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 and they were still both alive and, and interacting, but they were very different people. So she added that as another layer. Uh, all the research she did in advance to understand everything possible about the process of, and, you know, I regretted that we only had a two year program because if she had another year, it would have been the most amazing book. Um, and I still use those poems as examples to, for other classes to see what, the, what they can reach for, what they can aspire to. Uh, but you never know what it's going to be every year. I mean, it really is driven yeah. by whatever the students are interested in and whatever they can find in archives and, and what they choose to be triggered by or what kind of taps into their own personal obsession. You know, it's very important to me that there's some kind of emotional link to the poem you want to write even before it gets there, and then it, it helps almost guarantee the fact that that poem, when it's finished, will have a temperature, will have some emotional currency, and that makes it more accessible to people. I think that's when poems remind us of our own humanity, uh, they become more useful to people. You know, it's not just this two-dimensional thing on the wall, uh, or not just pretty words that sound good when you mm -hmm. rhyme them, but they they make you travel, they take you someplace else. And, you know, I think that my goal when I do a reading is the same thing I want for my students you know, when I listen to them read is that I want to be exhausted, you know, after <laughs> 30 minutes of reading. I want to be exhausted emotionally because they've taken me there. Uh, they made it easy for me to go with them. Uh, and, you know, I, I want to have been made to feel sad or to understand how to tap into that, you know, that the pain, the, you know, all the pathos uh, that comes with, you know, using emotional uh, currency on the page, you know, it's just about understanding how you feel and, and, and accessing your capacity to articulate that as clearly as possible. Thank you so much. Um, we do have one last question in the chat and I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, <laughs> Kevin Cordy is asking, how would you set up your poems to create a critical space for needed conversations? In other words, how do you prepare a group to talk about the issues around your poems? You know, I assume that, you know, people are reading. Uh, I don't, I really go into a space to talk about particular issues. You know, I may have to deal with censorship because of the grade level, you know, I, I have been given a list of poems of mine that I could not read when I arrived at certain schools, uh, which was quite flattering to me. Uh, you know, but you know, they discussed topics they didn't think they didn't want discussed in those schools. But I'm thinking, you know, that's exactly what the kids want to talk about the things that you make taboo. But that was an argument for another day. Uh, you know, I, I try not to control that. You know, one of my favorite things to do when I go to a space as a visiting writer is, is not do introduction. Uh, all the students, you know, they may have done whatever level of research, 
but they may know they may only know I'm a uh, but they have to ask me what they want to know or need to know about me before we do some work. Uh, and they always come from a very interesting. I mean, the the information is better. The questions are are, are sincere. And I'm always surprised at what they feel like they need to know before they trust me for the next hour to lead a workshop. Um, but it's a much better process than just reading my accolades. Because, you know, most young people aren't really impressed by that. Uh, and it, I think it creates a kind of divide between you and them from the beginning, you know. But if you leave it open ended and only tell them what they want to know, then I think it creates the beginning of a relationship uh, and they trust you more at least that's my goal and i, I feel like that's what has happened when i've done that well thank you very much for that answer um i as we wrap up here i am going to share a couple of links with our audience the first of which is to your publisher where they could purchase Mask Man Black. And I would also like to let everyone know if you are here in the Athens area, um, Little Professor Books has made an effort to get several of Frank X's titles in. So stop by and see Nick and pick up a few copies. Um, and then the second link is gonna be to just a brief survey to just get a little bit of feedback on our event this evening. Um, Beyond that, I just want to say thank you all so much for spending your time with us this evening. Frank X, thank you so much. This was wonderful. We really, really appreciate your time. Um, I hope you get a nap very, very soon. Uh, there's basketball on TV tonight, so I'm not. Oh, so probably not. <laughs> <laughs>